Well, yeah, thank you all so much for joining us. Um, I am one of the optometrists at Wing Vision, along with uh, Dr. Rock and Cook. And um, I'm happy to see some of my colleagues even from different states on this. So thanks for joining us. So I, I chose a topic that uh, actually I, I felt that I needed to, to grow in. And so, um, yeah, I would love interaction during this and, and discussion on how we can better treat, diagnose and treat our patients with an allergic and infectious conjunctivitis. So this slide is just basically summarizing the ones I'm gonna discuss under the category of allergic being seasonal or perennial conjunctivitis, a vernal conjunctivitis, atopic or giant papillary. Uh, under viral, I'm going to be covering adenoviral causes, herpetic causes, and then some other um, systemic or other causes. And I will touch on coronavirus. I, I'm not an expert, but I have been reading up on um, the latest updates from the Academy of Ophthalmology. And then I will also discuss uh, causes of bacterial. But as we know, a lot of these can have a lot of similar symptoms and presentations. And, and so that's kind of the why I wanted to look into doing the research on this to help better and more um, diagnose more quickly and treat our patients as well as we can. Just to show you how complex this is, this is a whole nother list on this slide that I will not be discussing, but there's a lot of other sources that don't fall under allergic or infectious. Um, being mechanical or irritative, immune-related or near plastic. So just keep this in mind if, as you're um, trying to navigate some of these challenging diagnoses. Um, as just there's there's several we're trying to develop a structure and framework to kind of put put these into so we can better uh, take care of our patients. So I'm going to start with um, seasonal and allergic conjunctivitis. I'm going to try to move this up first. Okay, so as we all know, season, seasonal is the most common. That's gonna be uh, more prevalent in the spring. It's from those tree grass um, pol um, pollens and allergens in the air. And then you ha have the perennial patients who are more year round, but they tend to have more flare ups in the fall. They think it's from pet dander or um, fungal allergens or dust mites. That tends to be uh, more aggressive in the fall and winter months. There we go. Um, so signs are going to be these, they can be during these flare ups, you can have watering, itching, that white kind of mucus discharge. Of course, this can be associated with systemic allergies and um, sneezing, nasal discharge is going to be accompanied by uh, lid inflammation. And generally, all of the allergic causes in general are going to be bilateral. Um, you may have some asymmetry, but they gen gen generally present in both eyes. And on presentation, we know that they have a papillary reaction. A lot of times with children, um, the chemosis can be a, a more prominent sign, um, but they can just have swelling just around the eyes in general. And if they've been rubbing a lot, that actually can discolor the surrounding eyelids. So just keeping it in mind, if they're, if they're itching and rubbing those eyes a lot, it can, it can affect the skin around. Then going right into the next category, a uh, vernal conjunctivitis, or does, we know that it can involve the cornea. Um, this is thought to be, it's a bilateral um, disorder, just like many of these under the allergic conjunctivitis are. Um, and they think it's because of an influx of, um, inappropriate influx of mast cells and um, immune cells just that come and just take they come in house in the um, conjunctiva, and it generally presents more in younger boys, so about five years old to teenage years, and then it tends to have remission and get into atopic, which I'll discuss in just a moment. But this tends to be more common in um, hot climates, hot, dry climates, so it's not as common here in Tennessee, um, but it's, it's going to be more common in the hotter seasons as well as hot climates. So signs of this are going to be similar to the itching and watering is going to be similar to all of the uh, allergic causes in particular, but um, these can have a, mu a thicker mucoid discharge as they get more severe. They can have blepharospasm or ptosis. Um, but one key thing, and I'll actually go ahead and move into the next slide to show you these pictures, is um, a couple of takeaways, if I could give you just a few from this lecture. One is that when you see patients coming in with conjunctivitis, flipping the eyelid can just make a, a big difference on helping us diagnose patients and giving us an eye, more of an idea of what's going on because these patients do have a giant papillary reaction under the lid. 
So, um, so flipping those eyelids can be very helpful in diagnosing these, these, uh, these patients. And also you can have um, horner trantis dots, which is on the lower picture there, showing those gelatinous bumps just on that superior limbus. Um, that's gonna be another sign of, of, of vernal conjunctivitis. And then um, shield ulcers can, can develop as well. So really trying to be proactive, catching these early and keeping in mind, you know, especially these younger, a younger boy or child is not going to have as much um, care about rubbing and, and that can actually have uh, ramifications down the road. So, um, and also keeping in mind if they're having these ulcers, treating them and the ulcers can off, obviously scar the scar the cornea and cause vision changes permanently. So catching these on the earlier side if we can to, um, to protect them for the long haul. Um, atopic conjunctivitis, which is kind of a, uh, almost like a cousin to vernal. Atopic generally presents in adults, um, but it has a lot of um, links to vernal. So it has um, similar papillary under the upper, papillary reaction under the upper lid as well as the potential for the Horner transit dots and the chemosis and the corneal involvement. Um, so it has a lot of similarities. It just tends to present later and have less chance of mucus discharge. It tends to be more watering. Um, and in these patients, they are just having chronic issues. Um, this is just kind of like, has similarities to perennial in that it's, it's present year round, uh, but typically worse in the winter. But just make sure, so I said one thing was to flip the eyelids. Another thing with our conjunctivitis patients is to just really think about and, and pay attention to the surrounding, um, the surrounding periorbital skin um, because the skin is going to be very telling because generally this is going to be correlated with atopic dermatitis, and eczema, asthma. It's, it's another inappropriate um, reaction of the immune system that's having way too strong of a response and inappropriate uh, movement of T cells and releases of IgE. Um, so you've got skin changes, eczema, excoriation from where they're scratching and they've got potential cracks. If you see the picture on the, um, on the side here, you can see a little, a little fold in the skin and that's called a Denny Morgan fold. So just from chronic rubbing, you're just gonna have, you're, you're gonna have skin changes. Um, they can also have hair loss. So the, you can see loss of the eyelashes. You can have potential loss of the temporal eyebrow. So I um, wanna be paying close attention and that's gonna be evidence that they've just been rubbing that skin. Of course, um, hyperpigmentation or changes in coloration can happen as well. So as I've already touched on, obviously we want to keep our patients comfortable and, and, and diagnosing these quickly is going to be um, helpful, but we really do want to think long-term um, for our patients. And we all know that that chronic rubbing um, associated with atopic dermatitis or allergies in general can predispose a patient to keratoconus, just weakening that corneal tissue. Um, another thought is also just knowing that our patients with chronic allergies and an inappropriate immune reaction to these allergens can also be predisposed to have um, infections, whether it's bacterial, fungal, or viral. Actually, we just had a patient during this outbreak that, um, as we all, many of on the on this call know that um, it can be tricky to navigate these over the phone, but um, had a patient with chronic allergic conjunctivitis and, and she was having a flare up, both eyes itching, watering, and actually it ended up being bilateral herpes, uh, herpes dendrites. So um, definitely want to keep that in mind that um, it's not, it can actually predispose patients for other conditions as well. Of course, using chronic steroid is going to have implications. And so we want to try to, and I'll get into treatment in just a second, but try to avoid them um, as much as we can, but definitely is going to be something that's important in some of those acute flare-ups, but knowing that, you know, it increases the pressure and it can predispose these younger patients in particular to, uh, to, to pre-senile cataract formation, and it can have implications of the, the surrounding skin as well. Um, these patients have a higher risk of retinal detachment than the general population. And then, of course, if um, with a case of um, atopic or vernal conjunctivitis, is there's that corneal involvement with a shield ulcer. I mean, you can have, you can have cor corneal scarring can happen from chronic inflammation in general, but you can also have corneal scarring from um, if an ulcer develops. Um, something that can be helpful diagnostically if you um, are having some 
difficulty discerning whether it's allergy or viral, this kind of have that the same watering um, itching presentation is using an IgE test. So all of the allergy types, um, the vernal, um, atopic, seasonal perennial, and giant papillary all have an elevated IgE in their tiers. So doing a tier sampling of that um, in office is a, is a rapid way to, to help to diagnose, um, to differentiate for, for more prompt treatment. Um, but skin testing and working with an allergy specialist would be helpful to localize maybe a specific allergen that they could start to avoid. So that leads right into the um, treatment. And one would be avoidance. So if you know what the allergen is, then encouraging the patients to avoid them if possible. Um, cool compression, artificial tears. Fortunately, there's a lot of over-the-counter options that are helpful for these patients. Um, mast cell stabilizers, antihistamines, and then our combination medications. One thing that I did find interesting in my research was that um, the, um, com the combination medications are really good. Um, and, all, and all of these are in acute uh, flare-ups, but mast cell stabilizer, stabilizers are actually, once you get that acute flare-up kind of un under control, and if, if you know the patient's prone to just chronic issues, then the mast cell stabilizers in isolation tend to do a better job at holding those mast cells together to prevent that release of histamine. And so um, something just to consider with our, with our atopic, perennial, just uh, GPC chronic chronic um, allergy patients. Um, if it's another option is to use topical NSAIDs if they're really uncomfortable, just keeping in mind that that's more of a short term option because that can, we don't want to tear up the cornea from chronic use. Topical steroids, I've already mentioned um, some of the long term concerns if you're using it chronically, uh, but these can be very effective for the um, for short term use and uh, low to prednol, um, for, uh, for methylone, some of these lower potent um, steroids would be the best option rather than jumping to a, a prednisolone treatment. Some, some stuff that I found in research that I thought was interesting in regards to immunosuppressive agents, I've actually never used this. I'm curious if some have, but tacrolimus ointment. So tacrolimus is apparently a medication that's used or has been used for um, organ transplantation so that patients are not overreacting and rejecting it. And they found that it was helpful in atopic dermatitis. And there's been some research with um, off-label use for um, atopic conjunctivitis. And they found that actually it had really good results for even for acute inflammation. And that using an ointment twice a day had similar results to using these steroids. And this is not gonna have some of those long-term consequences of the steroids. Another consideration is cyclosporin. So if we're catching vernal conjunctivitis in these young boys or atopic, um, potentially using cyclosporin can be helpful. Um, systemic cyclosporin is um, helpful in atopic conjunctivitis. And then of course, in more severe cases, you can consider using <clears throat> oral antihistamines, just uh, avoiding leukotrienes don't tend to be as effective. So like singular montelukas is not as effective as some of the oral antihistamines. And then acetylcysteine can be helpful for breaking up some of the mucus when they have a lot of that discharge. We have a quick question for you. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. Is Do you have a preference or is there any evidence about over-the-counter Zatitor alloy generic versus regular? And then also is Patidae significantly better than Zatitor alloy? Um, so yeah, to be honest, I, I, huh? Yeah, generic versus name brand. Yeah, I, I did come across a lot of research um, comparing those, to be honest. I, I didn't research um, a lot of specifics on differentiation between prescription versus over-the-counter. Um, but some of the vehicles are different. So I know the patidate, the, the dosage can be, the patients, some patients who haven't done well with the over-the-counter options have done better with the, um, the prescription options, so the dosage or the vehicles distributing that can be can be effective. Um, does any more? Is that good to go? You are all good to go for now. All right, thanks. Yeah, Tracy, I know what you mean. It's like not sure if I can move on. So um, another thought is considering to how can we be preventative and and helpful and um and in our patients and, and encouraging uh, mothers or pregnant women and 
and helping them to to think of how can they give a good nutrients to their children and and to help with building an immune system. I just came across some interesting research about vitamin D consumption while nursing can be helpful for immune differenti differentiation. Uh, probiotics to infants who are greater than six months old can be helpful, and then avoiding Tylenol use in pregnancy. Uh, there's always ongoing research regarding desensitization if you're older, and you know we figure out we they figure out what the allergen is, um, but it seems inconclusive based on what I've what I've researched on that. So I definitely would be consulting with an allergy specialist on that on that information. Another thing is giant papillary conjunctivitis for the last for, form of allergic conjunctivitis, and this can be caused from mechanical irritation. So this tends to be a little easier diagnosis with um, if you, you know, usually these are contact lens patients um, or a prosthetic or uh, maybe a suture, but also something like a scleral buckle. All of these things can cause that chronic irritation and get an inappropriate immune response. I'm not going to go too much into the grading because there's um, some differences between research on that, but basically we just can look mild. It's going to be minimal discharge, maybe some in the morning. They have a little discomfort with the contact lens in, uh, where all the way to se severe where you've got lots of mucus discharge, lots of, GP, uh, of giant papillary under the lid, uh, pain with the lenses on. So there's going to be a, a variance of presentations, but the number one treatment is to make sure we we encourage them to remove the source, um, the mechanical irritation, and uh, clean devices if they have a prosthetic. I know Tracy's already mentioned some things with the lubrication, but to removing devices, keeping them clean, uh, maybe changing to an RGP, a soft contact lens, um, and potentially considering a refractive surgery if that's an if that's if that's an option for these patients. And then, like I was mentioning, with the mast cell stabilizers, that can be helpful for preventing that release um, long term, and um, the antihistamine steroid and acetylcysteine can be helpful for the mucus discharge. So uh, moving right along into the viral sources of conjunctivitis, these are very common and they're also very contagious. So again, I'm gonna discuss some forms of adenoviral viral as well as herpetic causes and um, then some nonspecific causes and then get into um, a systemic cause from coronavirus potentially. So general symptoms of viral conjunctivitis, again, as I mentioned, sometimes um, this watering, the itching, they can, it can be present to both um, viral and allergic, but um, these tend to present with a unilateral eye, a unilateral red eye that moves over and becomes bilateral. You've got watering, you've got the lid edema. Uh, these patients generally do have lymph, lymph adenopathy with it. So making sure to palpate the lymph nodes in, the, uh, in front of the ear and then under the jaw or the mandible here. And if you can feel them, then that is considered lymph adenopathy. In certain cases, they're gonna be tender and that is gonna be like with EKC, but um, generally these will be palpable um, with viral conjunctivitis patients. They do present with follicles and um, they do, some of them have particular hemorrhaging and they can potentially have involvement of the cornea or maybe even anterior uveitis. The vast majority of these patients are going to be have, having a denoviral infection. So that's about 90%. Um, this can be from exposure to an infected individual, recent ocular testing, or recent res, re, upper respiratory infection. Um, and then I'm going to go into more detail about specifically epidemic carotid conjunctivitis, pharyngoconjunctival fever, as well as um, just other sources of adenal conjunctivitis. So starting with EKC, and this is a highly contagious form of a viral infection. It tends to be just like with the other viruses, uh, virus presentations, unilateral, and then progress over to bilateral. With two, up to two weeks of shed, um, it is also important, and I know we're all finding this out with the coronavirus outbreak, but um, up to two weeks of shed and then it can live on an inanimate object for up to like 40 days or something. So it is very important that we are proactive to clean and educate our patients of the importance of that, of hygiene. Um, with the, um, so I'm gonna say the two weeks of spread, oh, just as far as 
quarantine. Uh, I know we all know that now, but it, it is in particularly important with EKC for, for someone, especially children, to avoid going back to school. But this can be difficult, as we all know, for, um, for isolations. If someone, if there's like an outbreak in a hospital or something like that, you really, really need to avoid any sort of transmission. Uh, of this if possible. So week one, you're going to have some SVK involvement on follicles, and these patients can have membranes or pseudomembranes, and generally with a nodal involvement with EKC, they will have some, uh, it, will, it can be tender, um, so when you palpate, it can be tender to them. In the second week, you can have some central subepithelial defects that can affect vision, and um, they can, and they can express, they can have pain from those as well, and these can last for a few months. Touching on PCF next, um, this is the swimming pool conjunctivitis, conjunctivitis, and this usually presents with a triad. So you've got pharyngitis with a sore throat, fever, um, and the follicular conjunctivitis. So this happens about two to 10 days after exposure. It tends to be more present with uh, younger adults or um, kids after they've been exposed to in a, a communal pool or something like that. It is unilateral, progresses to bilateral within a few days, and they can have foreign body sensation, follicular conjunctivitis, watery discharge. Uh, they may or may not have lymph node involvement, and usually the cornea is not affected um, in these. Well, they may have some SPK, but no SCIs in this case. And there are other forms of adenoviral conjunctivitis that don't fall under the categories that I've mentioned, um, but they, as I mentioned before, they usually do have the lymph adenopathy to kind of help if there's um, some challenge in differentiation between this and allergic causes. Um, and this is very contagious. And one thing I did not have on the slide was is there is testing you can do in office to, um, to detect the presence of adenoviral, and that can be helpful for differentiation purposes. Uh, the main thing is, is with milder cases, these are gonna be self-limiting, but um, they, you do want to encourage isolation, prevent spread as much as possible, educate patients about um, how, you know, how it does spread from the fluid and how it can sit on the, you know, on a countertop for, for, for 40 days. So just being um, very proactive and educating about that. With more severe cases, if you've got membranes or pseudomembranes, keeping in mind uh, the long-term ramifications of that. So if you can, uh, taking an as putting an anesthetic in the eye and using a cotton tip applicator, try to remove uh, the membranes or pseudomembranes should be able to be removed fairly easy, easily. And we want to prevent those from adhering and causing scar tissue or potentially inappropriate adhesion of the palpebral and bulbar conge or symblepharon. Supportive therapy is encouraged, so you can get over-the-counter topical decongestants or cool compresses, um, artificial tears, or even topical NSAIDs, um, and then generally avoiding or just reserving steroids for more severe cases, maybe those ones that are presenting with membranes um, of this really just really strong immune reaction or those with SEIs, because um, it can, we do want the immune system be able to be able to fight the virus off but we don't want it to um, have scar tissue permanently. So I think I've already touched on the potential sequelae between the scar tissue and things like that. Uh, one treatment that is an off-label option is a betadine treatment in office. I actually had a friend, this is a few years ago, who was getting married and I was not her provider, but um, she had pink, this viral conjunctivitis that came up, we think it was viral, about three days before her wedding. Um, and the doctor did this beta dyeing treatment and she fortunately recovered within about two days and was ready to go for her wedding. So um, it's something you can consider. It's um, using about using a 5% beta dye or COVID on iodine drop and putting it in two dro couple drops in the eye, getting the patient to roll their eye, move it around or both eyes and moving them around. And then for about 30 seconds, 30 to 60 seconds, you don't need more than that. Uh, you can use a betadine solution swab, like a surgical prepping swab, and clean the area well around their eyelids. And then after you finish that, irrigating for um, a couple minutes. And that will leave them stained for a few hours. But um, research has shown that this povidone iodine solution does have, um, does kill the virus. We just don't have clinical research, so it is an off-label treatment that, that what we can consider for patients. And then you would want to give them a topical instead as their eye will be uncomfortable for a few hours that day. 
Um, another option or another study that's being considered is dexamethasone povidone iodine drops. Um, it, they're currently in phase three trials, but it's these drops that you do four times a day for five days. And studies seem very promising, um, but still just need more, more uh, results. But um, it is something that could potentially be really transformative in how we're treating our patients because it, it has potential to treat both viral and bacterial causes. And I know in some of the, the research, it was saying 30% um, or I'm sorry, 60% um, of patients without, it was roughly 50 to 60% of patients without this treatment with the placebo were fully cover, recovered at six, day six and about 80% of patients with this drop um, had complete um, resolution of the viral, virus particles in their tears. So um, it was clinically significant. We're just waiting to see kind of what comes out. We have a quick um, question for you. Sure. Okay. Um, so this question is about prescribing steroids instead of NSAIDs. Is that okay post betadine treatment? Yeah, so um, I would say it, it just depends on the, I would say looking at the cornea and seeing how that looks after doing the treatment um, would probably be, I, I think either way would be okay. Yeah, I think right. steroids would be okay. Thank you, is there any more? <laughs> While we're on that, uh, yes, another question just came in is which allergy drops do you recommend? Which allergy eye drops do you recommend? Yeah, so I, as I was saying, I think um, there's a lot of over-the-counter options are sometimes easier for the patient to obtain, but um, there is actually a new one. Um, I'm going to mispronounce it, Zervier, that just came out. There's some different combination. The Preve is an excellent com combination um, combination drop. Um, and a mast cell stabilizer is um, Necromol. That Necromol is a good one that's um, just specifically for mast cell stabilization. Uh, so those are ones that I would consider, but they're, there's a lot of options out there. So, um, but Alloway and Zatatory are usually ones that I find easy to recommend for over the counter. And then um, Bepreve is an easy um, prescription combo drop. So yeah, hopefully that, that answers that question. All right, I'm gonna move right along to uh, acute hemorrhagic conjunctivitis. This is more uh, present in lower socioeconomic status um, areas and also potentially tropical climates. It is has a pretty scary presentation with a really, really bright um, or really painful eye that has prominent subconjunctival hemorrhages, watery discharge and follicular conjunctivitis. Um, but fortunately, this is a self-limiting condition and um, supportive therapy and then just educating on how it is very contagious, so we would want to educate the patient on that. So um, again, this is be something if you're, you know, practicing somewhere else. It is a pretty rare condition, um, but it just with that prominent um, hemorrhaging, it can it can present pretty scary. But educating our patients on that, if you do come across this really rare condition, uh, steroids would be used with caution because there is concern that if you give steroids to these patients, it can predispose them for a subsequent bacterial infection. So maybe doing a combination, um, a combination steroid antibiotic if you're considering doing that. Um, but again, just mostly supportive therapy for these patients. So another, uh, going right into the herpes simplex virus causes, or herpes virus, I'm gonna cover simplex first. And um, this is something that usually presents unilateral. It can present bilaterally, but it is usually a unilateral presentation of uh, foreign body discharge, watering, conjunctival injection, follicular reaction. And these patients can have the tender lymph nodes. Um, and then also you want to make sure to check their eyelids. They may have a vesicular reaction of the eyelids or, um, and then also their cornea. Of course, they, you wanna be looking for, on the lookout for dendrites. Usually with the primary presentation, um, patients will not have involvement of epithelium, but um, it, that usually will present a secondary, um, and secondary infections. And uh, one thing I thought was interesting was that um, if, if, if you do have a viral conjunctivitis and it's coming in as unilateral, 
because usually it goes to both thighs. It, just to be something in the back of your mind is considering herpes simplex because a lot of children may have this and because uh, you have to have that primary infection for it to lie dormant. Um, but um, is, is maybe culturing these patients. Of course, you're not going to take a child and put them on an uh, antiviral orally permanently, but there has been some uh, research that encouraging you to use potential acyclovir like for a couple weeks um, to prevent spread of the infection. And also it's been shown to um, potentially decrease recurrence. Um, so just, I think it would be helpful if you do have a child that you're having several signs that it could be herpetic, then you may want to culture just for the sake of knowing and being able to educate the, pa the parent, patient and parents in regards to the potential for, for reinfections with this. So in these cases, you don't want to use steroids. Um, again, as I mentioned, acyclovir is, um, is helpful. Um, and typically, you this is going to resolve within one week. Um, if there is any concern for potential if it's a more serious case, if there's any concern that there could be potential corneal involvement, then using trifluridine or getting cyclovir um, every day for the week would be helpful. Five times a day for trifluridine or three times for getting cyclovir. And obviously, if the cornea is in fact and for sure involved, you're going to increase that to the appropriate dosage of nine times a day and five times a day. Just make sure to educate these patients that it can recur. Um, especially for parents with this primary presentation and their and, and children. Um, another form of herpetic conjunctivitis is the varicella zoster virus or the herpes zoster virus. And um, so this can present, again, primary infection with a child who has chickenpox. Um, it could also present, and more, more likely most of us have seen it as the um, herpes zoster virus presenting from the dormant um, viral virus that was harboring in the trigeminal nerve and then re-manifesting at a time of stress or just age and uh, different things can um, compromised immune system can cause this to present. About one-fourth of patients who have shingles, they present on the um, ophthalmic portion of the trigeminal nerve. So this, it is something that we definitely want to catch early. It can have a lot of other presentations. Fortunately, most people do have some sort of vesicular reaction on their skin, um, but sometimes this can present even as a palsy or um, they can present with anterior uveitis. Um, of course, they can have also involvement of the cornea. So definitely treating these patients and trying to treat them as quickly as we can diagnose it is, is good. Um, we, definitely, we definitely want to use oral because we've got to take care of their, their skin, and, and that also permeates to the eye as well. So oral acyclovir, valcyclovir, famvir can be important for those cases. Um, and then you're, also, you're trying to catch it, if possible, within 72 hours of them developing these symptoms, because the long-term ramifications of like her, post-herpatic neuralgia or um, neurotrophic keratitis can be diminished the earlier we, we find out and, and treat these patients. And then another source of conjunctivitis, viral conjunctivitis is molluscum contagiosum. And these are going to have those little deposits around the eyelids or maybe even on the bulb or conjunctiva. So we want to make sure, I know I mentioned flipping the eyelids earlier, um, palpating the lymph nodes is important, and then also make sure to examine the periorbital skin. And these can be, um, sometimes they can be a little harder to find, but I'm definitely looking for these in the cases of chronic conjunctivitis that's follicular. Um, it can range from mild to severe and um, typically is more present with um, older children or young adults and can manifest with immunocompromisation. So the treatment, you know, you can use some supportive therapy to try to calm it down, but ultimately um, excision is going to be the main thing for um, getting rid of the, the actual culprit. So these, these excisions would need to be um, taken care of. You would need to take these out to, to prevent the chronicity of the, of, the, of the condition. Of course, just like with everything else, the more chronic it is, the more potential for conjunctival scarring, epithelial keratitis, and PNS that we're trying to avoid. And then with the coronavirus, um, so this is obviously something that's a hot topic for all of us. Um, from what I'm re researching currently, it can present with a nonspecific follicular viral conjunctivitis. Um, but based on the research so far, I think there's a study with 1,100 patients and only eight of which had um, con conjunctival symptoms. And so it's very 
uh, has a very low prevalence, even amongst those um, with coronavirus. And there is thoughts that it can be the, the earliest signs of early presentation, but it also can present later in, in more severe cases where these patients are in the hospital. There's thought though, in some of the, the later cases that it could be from fluid retention in the body and just, um, yeah, too much fluid and causing that chemosis and stuff like that. So there is confusion whether that is in fact a conjunctivitis or not. Um, what I did find was interesting is that patients who did have conjunctival findings, um, being the red eyes, follicles, watering, only a portion of those patients actually had the viral particles in their tear, in their tears. And so um, of, the of the research that I've done, uh, it seems as though only those who have presenting symptoms actually have the particles um, detectable in the tears. And, um, and of those who have, there was a study, I think it was 72 patients, two of which had conjunctivitis symptoms, and only one of those had actual uh, tested positive in the tear film. So I'm not saying that we shouldn't have any precautions because we absolutely should. And unfortunately, the virus is susceptible to our typical bleach and um, alcohol cleaning disinfectant. So we definitely want to be proactive with that and our protective equipment. Um, but th it did seem that they were isolated to, um, to patients with actual conjunctivitis symptoms as far as the presentation in the tear film. So moving right along to your uh, bacterial conjunctivitis. So I'm gonna group everything that is not the STD, non, not gonorrhea into one category. Um, so non-gonococcal bacterial conjunctivitis, and this is gonna have acute onset. Um, it's gonna have the, the same symptoms, burning, grittiness, redness, but then the discharge is generally um, either, it's kind of that yellowish discharge, mucoperulent or purulent. Um, it can start off as watering, but it can change pretty quickly to that. And it, it usually is bilateral within a couple days of um, starting. And the patients may present with um, some, their lids being stuck together upon awakening, some papillae of the, of the um, conjunctiva, or, and they generally do not have lymph adenopathy. So you won't be feeling the lymph nodes if you, if you palpate. Um, some of the common culprits are going to be staph aureus, streptococcal pneumoniae, haemophilus influenzae. Um, of course, staph is on our lid margin, and something that can kind of flag that particular one is marginal corneal infiltrates. Um, haemophilus influenzae is, is less common um, because it is more um, due to the vaccination, but it can present in children. And just a, um, a quick tip on that is with them, um, if, if a child does present, there is a there is a higher likelihood, especially up in the Northeast, that, um, I'm sorry, in the Southeast, um, that it could be homophilus influenza. And, and you want to be aware that these, um, I would watch them carefully. Some providers even start them on orals because a, um, conjunctiva, a bacterial conjunctivitis in a kid can progress to becoming um, an ear infection or other, even sur surrounding, um, in, in, infected surrounding tissues. And then um, streptococcal may have some particular hemorrhages and pseudomembranes, um, and that may be more present in the, in the Northeast. And then I'm not going to go too much into the other causes because fortunately, um, most of these will respond well to a good broad spectrum antibiotic. And um, you'll just use these three times a week for one week, or if there are more severe cases, you could use them every two hours for a couple of days, followed by about four days of four times a day. Um, you can use antibiotic ointments. These, um, you may want to use a combination steroid antibiotics for the presence of subepithelial infiltrates. And um, you also want to consider that if you, if you have some membrane involvement, which I actually didn't touch on um, previously in the, in the treatment for, for the viral causes, but um, if you can remove those membranes. I'm, I think I did say that. You want to try to remove membranes with a uh, cotton tip applicator in office to prevent scar tissue. Um, as far as um, the blepharite, you want to look at the lids, and especially with, with staph, that's going to be very present on the eyelids. So doing the lid cleaning, as uh, Tracy was mentioning earlier, uh, the eyelid scrubs can be helpful to, to, to get some of that potential exposure off of the eyelids. And irrigation, if there's a lot of discharge, obviously no contacts, good hygiene, and you want to follow these about every three to four days. 
and obviously return if it starts to worsen. Uh, fortunately, like I was mentioning, there's a lot of good options. A lot of the fourth generation fluoroquinolones are really great. Um, Tobermycin and gentamicin are more gram negative coverage, so we'd want to do more of uh, a broader spectrum. One thing that is good if you, if there is any concern for MRSA is to add in uh, polytrim or um, in more severe cases, potential fortified vancomycin may be helpful if, if there's a high suspicion for that. Um, if they're coming from, you know, a nursing home or something like that, then um, and you're suspe suspecting MRSA, then I would definitely add um, one of those two options in. As far as, um, what's it going to say is, I think I was going to say something else about MRSA, but I cannot remember at this time. Um, well, with some yeah. questions, that's okay. Um, yeah. We have questions. So they're pretty much on this topic. Uh, how do you address a patient who has both follicular and papillary response? Um, I often find it's a mix so tough to say the exact etiology without culturing and if other symptoms don't line up. Sometimes the eyes are showing signs of both possible and viral bacterial. So how, how do you handle that? Yeah. Um, so I'm actually going to cover uh, a couple more cases causes with the potential for chlamydia and things like that in just a few slides. But, um, but yeah, that's, I think, what's so tricky. I'm, I'm hopeful for this new potential, hope, this medication with the dexamethasone, povidone iodine, because it's actually treating both causes. Um, if, there, if it's a very severe case, I mean, it, I think potentially um, just treating an, an, with an antibiotic, you know, if, if, if you're not sure whether it's viral or bacterial, culturing the patient, sending that out for, for results. Um, and then if it is um, going ahead and implementing an, a bacterial an antibiotic, you know, can be, can be important for, for patients if you suspect bacteria. Um, if it's like a really, really severe case, I mean, there is concern for um, potential like hyperacute conjunctivitis, then you would want to go ahead and treat with orals. And I'll get into that in just a moment. But um, it really depends on the severity. But I think if there's any question as far as the discharge or um, if there's some confusion between the two, I, I think starting an antibiotic would be helpful uh, topically. Um, and then I'm going to, I'll go ahead and get touch on the next case that, that may help to expand a little bit more on that question. And the next question it, you, you pretty much answered, but there's concern about using antibiotics for, for um, viral infections due to resistance, but sometimes we cannot rule out bacterial. Would hyperchlor or tea tree oil or something similar would be better or both? Yeah, um, I think it's, I think it's, tr it's tricky if you, if you truly feel like they're, um, if it's like a more severe case, I mean, bacterial infections, the body can, can fight that off too. If it's, so if it's mild and you just want to kind of keep an eye on it, it's a little hard to discern. Both of them can be, um, the body can fight, tort, fight those off. So if you just feel the need to monitor, but if it is more severe and there is, if it's difficult to, to discern between the two, I think implementing a bacterial, an antibiotic would be important. Awesome, and we'll hold the next question until further on because I think you, you might touch on it. Okay, thank you. So um, if you do have this um, hyperacute conjunctivitis come in, this is gonna be for it to hopefully pretty pretty easy to, uh, to detect versus a, a less severe form, but you're gonna have a lot of copious muco, muco, mucoid discharge, purulent discharge. Um, they will have preauricular lymphadenopathy. It is so. This is a very alarming, um, alarming patient to come into our office. So, and actually, hope, usually we won't be seeing neonates, but this can present in children uh, or neonates one to seven days after birth, and can be um, can be very, very alarming as well. One thing um, amidst all the craziness of what's going on with the tons and tons of edema and discharge is also just making sure you look at the cornea carefully because these patients can have um, an infiltrate or an ulcer that potentially can begin superiorly and that can lead to a potential perforation. Um, so these are going to be ones that you want to start treatment as soon as possible. You're going to culture them, but you're going to be starting treatment as soon as possible. Um, but also knowing that um, with potential concern for cornea involvement with you know, ulceration or potential perforation, you're going to want to even send these, these patients to the hospital because these can, um, this can be vision threatening, but also life threatening. So the corneal infection, scarring, perforation can, can affect the eye, obviously, uh, pelvic inflammatory disease is a concern or urethritis. Um, these patients can be septic. 
if it's a neonate, they're going to need um, immediate urgent treatment because they can also get become septic and it can affect the meninges. So anyway, it's something you want to culture and, and even before you get the culture back, you, if you're really highly suspicious for this in any way, you should go ahead and start treatment. And if, in any case of finding um, gonorrhea, you're going to want to um, report it to the public health authorities. Um, so for the treatment, it's going to be ceftriaxone and intramuscular or azithromycin and azithromycin orally. Um, you can also do doxycycline twice a day for seven days. Again, with the more severe cases, if there's any concern of like corneal involvement and, or if it's, you know, having any signs of um, inflammation inside the eye, like endophthalmitis or something, these are going to be ones you're sending pretty much right over for inpatient and potential IV septoriaxone or antibiotics to, to help their body fight this off. Um, you also want to really clean out all that discharge as much as you can. If the, when the cornea or if the, if the eye is significantly involved in particularly the cornea, you want to start that broad spectrum antibiotic and sometimes um, a cycloplegia or potentially if there's raging inflammation inside the eye, you're going to need a steroid as well. Uh, you're going to follow these patients daily. Um, again, they may even need inpatient, um, inpatient treatment in the hospital and you want to educate them about potential concomitant disease and refer them appropriately. In children, if this presents, there's a high suspicion of sexual abuse. Um, it's, and then the next one, uh, is chlamydia, adult inclusion conjunctivitis, and this is from chlamydia ob obligate intracellular parasite. So this is going to be um, usually presenting unilaterally. It can have this, the redness from body sensation and watering, but it usually is um, unilateral and it can be chronic. These generally do have tender lymph nodes, so making sure to palpate that. Flipping the upper lid can be helpful because they, they can have a follicular response on the inferior conge and then they can have a papillary reaction on the, on the superior palpebral conge. So that can be helpful if it's, if it's more chronic, they, they can present with both of those. But with any patient with a chronic um, conjunctivitis, maybe these patients have had some improvement with, um, with uh, steroid drops or something previously and they just haven't improved, it keeps coming back. This, so it's more of a chronic condition. You definitely want to be considering chlamydia. Um, these can have corneal involvement as well, so make sure to check the, check the cornea. Um, and in, in these cases, when you've got chronic follicles and typically presenting unilaterally, we, we need to enter into maybe a more difficult conversation or um, yeah, just asking our patients about their recent sexual exposure. I will mention one thing, if they do have chronic follicles, chronic conjunctivitis, um, conjunctivitis, do look at the eyelids carefully because if they have molluscum contagiosum, that would be a potential other, another cause of chronic follicular conjunctivitis. So just keep that in mind before you jump right into a um, sexual history question and, and, and asking them about things like that. But, um, but definitely, would, if there's any concern, you definitely need to ask these patients and potential exposure to STDs. Generally, chlamydia is in combination with gonorrhea. So um, I know I didn't mention that previously with that hyperacute, but that treating this and, and inquiring and working with specialists to try to help these patients long-term, uh, protecting their, their whole body uh, with, with these considerations. Um, asking about urinary tract infections, but sometimes conjunctivitis can be the first presentation of this problem for people. So just to keep in mind, uh, if there's any concern for your culture, um, and then you want to treat systemic with systemic therapy, just like with gonorrhea, you have to start a systemic therapy to treat the whole person. So azithromycin, one gram, one dose per week until resolution. Uh, doxycycline, 100 milligrams twice a day does help as well. Topical therapy is more um, just adjunctive. We can use ointments. Um, fluoroquinolones, if you're in some place where you don't have any access to orals for some reason, a, a fluoroquinolone can be helpful, um, but really systemic antibiotics are necessary. And again, as I mentioned, talking to um, a specialist and um, especially with these confirmed cases, educating the patient about um, abstinence until resolution and um, potentially if they do not treat this, it can cause the infertility as, as well as other, as other issues systemically. And then you would monitor these in a couple weeks. And again, with any STD concern or um, diagnosis, you would want to report it to the State Department. 
And then lastly, another form of chlamydial bacterial conjunctivitis is trachoma. And again, this is another condition that's more localized to um, underdeveloped countries. And um, this particular one actually presents more with um, follicles under the upper lid, but um, it can have follicles and papillae. Actually, um, in more severe cases, you can see Herbert's pits or Arlt's lines. So Herbert's pits would be where they had follicles on the limbus that eventually became depressed. And um, so they were, it's like little depressions. And then Arlt's line, it's gonna show up in that picture, they've got arrows right there. That's just showing where you have potential scarring from the chronic follicular or papillary response. And um, so treating these patients, if we catch it early, is ideal. Um, for, unfortunately, you know, these patients don't have access to healthcare, and so they they um, have a lot of scarring and tropia and trichiasis from this. So and it would need like a cornea transplant and um, a lid reconstruction surgery to really help them. But um, the earlier that you can help these patients if possible with the zithromycin and the doxycycline treatment can, um, can help to prevent blindness. So, so that's um, all I have there. I know we have just a couple more minutes. Um, I guess, yeah, just some questions to, to think about in regards to when we come across these patients. Um, and I won't read through all of those, but I do want, I think if you take away three things um, as far as diagnosis of these patients is to avert the eyelids, examine the surrounding lid very carefully for any lesions on the face or scalp or right there in bet even between the eyelashes, you know, th things like blepharitis, um, a ulceration or something from herpes simplex um, or herpes zoster and uh, molluscum contagios, and those can all be very helpful to, to, to help us to cue in on the diagnosis. And then make sure to palpate the preauricular and submandibular lymph nodes. So that is all I have. Um, any questions? Um, so we do have a few questions here. Um, mm -hmm. Do you feel it's necessary to add antibiotic ointment for bedtime coverage on top of antibiotic drops? Um, I would say it, it really depends on the severity of it. I think it can be helpful, you know, if, if it's a more severe case, you want to get as much, you know, treatment as you can 24 hours. So if there is, um, if it's a more severe case, adding the antibiotic ointment can be both helpful for comfort, lubrication, as well as um, getting them kind of that full, that more 24 hour treatment. All right, and this is kind of a question slash request, but this is a good time to do it. If, if you can put your PowerPoint back on, someone's asking you to please put up the slide with the helpful case history so they can take a screenshot. Oh, sure, yeah. While we're on this topic, um, several people have asked if we can make these available after. Um, we are recording these, and um, with the consent of every speaker, we, we should be able to make at least some of them available. Um, and I'll, we'll plan to try to email that information out with, um, with the COPE certificates. Uh, while we're on that note, um, please give us about a week or, or so to get those. Um, all your information will be submitted directly to Arbo with your OE tracker number, and then we should be getting you your certificates. If you don't receive a certificate for any reason, you can respond to any of the confirmation emails. That'll go to Kayla, Kayla at wingvisioninstitute.com, but you don't have to remember that because you can just respond to any of those confirmation emails and, and um, that will alert us and we'll, we'll, do, we'll investigate for you. And thank you again. Uh, can you see, I, I can't see my... Uh, can you hit your back arrow maybe a couple times? Maybe, there we go, there we go. Can you see that? Right. Leave that up for the rest of the questions if that's okay. Um, and then, uh, oh, one more question actually. How about treating a red eye over telemed during the COVID-19 pandemic where we can't see details of anterior segment as detailed as we would via slip lamp? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. It was kind of one of the um, prompts for me to, to look into this myself. Um, I, I mean, honestly, this slide would be something, a great reference because there is a lot of things you can find out from just asking these questions. Um, but yeah, I do think that, you know, if you're, if they're, you know, very photophobic or, um, I mean, if you're concerned for cornea stuff, it's going to be important to, to bring them in. I, I don't really know of, I, I don't recommend prescribing a steroid drop um, unless it's extremely clear what it is from a telemedicine call. 
Um, but for, yeah, I do think that these questions listed here can be helpful from, uh, you know, you know, do your eyes itch, you know, asking the discharge, what kind of discharge, if they've had a recent upper respiratory infection, um, presence of fever, and um, they can even, you can even ask them to potentially pathway kind of touching their own lymph nodes, um, contact lens wear. So there is quite a few things that if you ask them a, a thorough history, you can rule out several things, um, but it is, it is tricky. Definitely tricky with uh, even with telemedicine to, to diagnose some of these cases.